agriculture educator located in Omaha. Uh, and so I teach people about fruit and vegetables and I help people set up uh, small farms and urban farms uh, as part of my job um, with a lot of other things going on uh, as well. And so I'll let uh, our other uh, teammates introduce themselves uh, and uh, share a little bit about what's going on in their garden, a sentence or two, what's happening at home right now. And we'll start uh, first on my list. Oh, uh, John Fesch, you popped up. There you go. Well, thank you, John. And I have to say that I primarily am focusing on herbs. I really enjoy growing herbs. They are aromatic and they can be used in lots of culinary uh, purposes. And um, in my own garden, I don't have enough sun for many vegetables, but I can grow just about all the herbs. Um, and like I say, I get to enjoy the neighbor's garden. I get to look across and see uh, his and her um, tomatoes because they have a lot of sun and drip irrigation. But I've just really been enjoying, I grow some rosemary, I grow some thyme, um, some sweet bay, um, uh, and some basil, and I get to enjoy those. And, and uh, just really do a lot for me. So I appreciate the opportunity. And they. So your sweet bay, and are you growing that in a pot and taking that in and out? I am. I'm growing it in a pot, and I just dug a hole and sunk the pot, the clay pot, in the ground. And um, if you're not familiar with sweet bay, it's what most of us call bay leaf that you would put in a soup or a stew or a roast or something like that. And I kind of grow it just for the novelty of it, although I have made a couple of, of um, a roasts with it, and it tastes just like the bay in the, in the store, except it's kind of fun because you grew it yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I just got a plant this year, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, Amy, you're out fishing. I am uh, out fishing. So I'm Amy Timmerman. I'm uh, located up at O'Neill. So I'm the odd one of the group. I'm actually a uh, crops and water. So I talk more about corn and soybeans, but my specialty area is plant diseases. So, um, so I like talking about plant diseases and helping with any issues there. So for my home garden, um, we actually grow a, a quite a bit because uh, I do a lot of canning. So we were super excited. We've had our first three pickings of green beans and we're looking at our first yellow squash and zucchini. Hopefully we'll maybe get picked tonight or tomorrow. And on the disease side, I got early blight like crazy in my tomatoes and my heirloom tomatoes, but that's okay. Disease is fun to look at. Yeah, there's lots going on. In our conversation already, we have questions in the chat that we'll get to uh, as we get through our introductions. So thank you for that, Amy. Uh, and yeah, I'm sure we'll have some tomato questions, some early blight and uh, septorial leaf spot, I think, are going on out there. And luckily we have some experts. Next on my list to introduce themselves is Elizabeth. Hi everybody, my name's Elizabeth Ekstrom. I'm an extension educator out of the Hall County Extension Office. And I am accountable for the center third-ish of the state. Um, in my home garden, we just recently moved and so I am growing in containers. So big uh, cattle lick tubs um, in my landscape right now. So I've been doing that for quite a few years and thankfully I planted them up before we moved. So if you have not heard Japanese beetles have hit Grand Island and they are in the Kearney area. So fielding a lot of those questions and I'm sure we'll talk about them more as we go on tonight. Oh yeah, I'm sure that'll be a hot topic. Uh, so thanks for bringing that up. Uh, speaking of Japanese beetles, uh, one of the people that can help us deal with that is Jody Green. Hello. I don't Hello. have my own garden that actually grows food because I don't cook. I am no longer ashamed of it. I just don't. But I do grow uh, flowers for pollinators and I hang out at the Hope Garden and help out with the donations. And so I do help 
the master gardeners with their growing of vegetables to donate. So I'm not growing anything that I can eat. I leave it for the bugs, but thanks. Yeah, she feeds the bugs. Uh, Sarah, I think you popped on there. I did. Hey, good evening, everybody. So we're just talking about what's going on in our landscapes or, or what, we, what we're passionate about. Yeah. What's going on in your garden right now? In my what, garden. Who are you? Who are you or where are you? Um, so uh, Sarah Browning, I am the horticulture extension educator out of Lancaster County uh, in Lincoln. And um, I, uh, I actually serve Lancaster, York, Seward, Odo, and Cass County. So that's kind of the region that I, uh, I help out primarily. Um, so in my garden, uh, I don't have any vegetables this year, honestly. Uh, I have a, a big back border that's kind of a mixed um, woody plants, trees, shrubs, perennial border that I love to putter around in. And um, uh, my perennial hibiscus are just about getting ready to bloom just in time for the Japanese beetles to come in and start chewing their flowers off. <laughs> but still, I'm excited to see the first flowers of the year. So that'll be nice. Yeah, nice. Well, welcome, Sarah. Uh, how about Scott? Uh, thank you, John. Um, my name is Scott Evans. I'm an, an extension assistant in horticulture. I'm in the Douglas Sharpie County area. I work out of the Omaha office with uh, with John, John, and Judy, and um, uh, we, uh, I help coordinate the Master Gardener program. That's my primary focus, and I do a lot of education with the public and answering the telephone calls, emails, and whatnot. And this year, uh, uh, my partner and I, we love tomatoes. Um, that is a that is why we garden because of tomatoes, and we are trying the white tomasol tomato this year. It's an all white tomato, and um, we are super excited that it has finally started to set fruit. Um, here in Omaha, the heat has been an issue, so a lot of our plants have been struggling for um, to set fruit. Now, the million dollar question is, we don't know when this plant is going to be ripe because it's going to be white. So we're kind of excited just to see how it works. Um, um, I have a former colleague who grew it. Um, she said that it tastes like cardboard, and I am excited to try cardboard tomatoes. So I will keep everybody posted as this progresses. So, um, but again, I'm out of the Omaha office, so um, I'd be more than happy to help anybody out. So if they taste like cardboard, they might be marginally better than the tomatoes you buy at the grocery store. <laughs> yeah, at least I can say that we grew the cardboard tomatoes at home. I, so, but it's going to be kind of fun. I mean, they look interesting. I'm like, we always try to challenge ourselves with something that uh, we haven't grown before. And we're like, why not a white tomato? That's right. Try something new. Uh, I have Kyle. Hello. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I was going to to say that I'm not. I don't. I don't really have anything going on in my garden this year because I moved as well. But Elizabeth kind of put me to shame there because she still has a garden after moving. But she's a better person and better gardener than I am. So. I, I don't, we, we tried it, um, we had a few tomatoes in, in five gallon buckets and then there was a pretty major windstorm in Lincoln, oh, about a week ago and well, I lost them all. So we, we tried, but okay. Um, yeah, typically we try to have a pretty, pretty large space. Um, my wife does a lot of, she does a lot of canning. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, tomatoes and peppers and herbs and, just all sorts of all sorts of fun stuff. I like to try the different sorts of peppers. And so last year, the uh, we had some of the uh, um, some of the Mad Hatter peppers last year that I was pretty excited about. But yeah, um, as for who I am, I guess I am the uh, I, I coordinate the plant plant and pest diagnostic clinic. So mainly deal with the the rots and spots, but try to answer kind of all general questions. And he's uh, growing killer mushrooms in the background there. Yes, indeed. Yeah. 
Uh, and then I think that leaves Terry, last but not least. Well, it's very nice to meet everyone. Um, I am Terry James. I am um, <clears throat> not housed um, in a county like most of the other educators that you've met tonight. I actually live on campus. Um, I am housed within the agronomy and horticulture department. Um, my two jobs are um, the state master gardener program and then backyard farmer. So um, there are several of you that you see that are on the backyard farmer show, but you always hear my voice every week. So uh, you actually never get to see me. Um, my one fun gardening thing is today I've basically been in meetings all day on Zoom. And when I had about an hour break, I went out to go look at my garden. I saw one leaf on my zucchini plant starting to fall. So I rushed out and checked it out. And I had a squash vine borer going up into that leaf. I plucked the leaf off and I stabbed it with a piece of metal and got it before he got inside the interior of my zucchini plant. So nothing like good IPM practices. Right. Scouting every day. Yep, gotta watch out for those. Those are uh, a pain. So that's the whole team. We, we had a bunch of people on uh, so we can help answer questions and we've got a bunch in the chat. Uh, so we'll go ahead and what I'm gonna actually do right now stop sharing my screen so you can see more of us uh, and let me go back and see what these questions are scroll all the way back here uh, so you can ask your question uh, feel free to type it in the chat feel free to to uh, unmute yourself and say hello and ask your question uh, we want to hear from you so we can uh, answer your questions uh, and some of our introductions, I think, uh, have uh, sparked some questions. Uh, so the first one that I see is, can you get rosemary to overwinter? Uh, where are you at? I think that was John's discussion about herbs. So team, what do we think about rosemary and potential overwintering? Well, rosemary, I've always been fascinated with it. I was first introduced to it in California. Um, and there, of course, it will overwinter. I also visited uh, some friends of mine in South Carolina, and they're about zone seven, maybe zone eight, and it'll overwinter there. Um, we're in the eastern part of the state, five-ish, and the western part of the state, I suppose, four, but it won't overwinter in Nebraska. But what I'd really like to know is somewhere in between here and maybe North Texas, if it would, um, it's just, uh, it doesn't have that, that oomph to make it through a Nebraska winter. So John, my mom had it in Southern Missouri okay. and protected, she could get it to overwinter oh. down there. And she was the low six, so six B ish. Okay. Um, so if she treated it like a rose bush and mounted up some, some, uh, wood chips across the top of it after yeah. Giving some time, maybe that would uh, take it over. Okay, yeah. cool. You yeah, could also, I, think I was just going to say, John, that you could also bring the rosemary in the house, but right. it, it does like cooler conditions. If you're going to bring it into the house, it likes to be, you know, in a, a really cool location, like maybe um, somewhere between 55 and about 65. So if you can find a place where you can still give it some light and some sun, but it'll be really on the cool side then you could try to overwinter the plants in the house. Yeah, and I was gonna say there are some varieties that are more winter hardy or cold hardy than others. So you wanna look. So some of them I think are closer to our hardiness zone. I don't, you know, they're not like 100% hardy, but it will be easier to get those if you mound soil up or, or mulch over them. It'll be easier to get them to survive than the ones that, you know, only grow in zone seven or eight or, yeah, so you want to look at the zones on those. It's something to be, um, when you try to overwinter rosemary indoors, it does occasionally get powdery mildew. So uh, just be aware of that, um, that put it in an area that gets uh, good air circulation. Yeah, and the number one, I think the number one cause of death in rosemary, especially indoor rosemary, 
but you see those all the time at the holidays, those little like rosemary Christmas trees that they sell. Like when I was younger, I would always buy one of those because I wanted a rosemary and you know, I knew, I knew it wasn't winter hardy, so I could keep it indoors and it died almost you know, instantly and it's over watering. Rosemary does not like to have wet feet. So you, you know, if you, if you buy one in a pot or put it in a pot, you have to make sure it doesn't sit in water. It actually has to dry out slightly between watering so that it doesn't die and it will die very quickly. Okay, next question is a bug question. So bug people at the ready. Uh, I have lace, uh, lace kale in my garden this year and I'm struggling with little green worms that look uh, like dry tips on the leaves uh, and there are dry tips on the leaves. So that might not be a bug question. What can I do to eliminate the worms? So it sounds like we have some worms on our kale. So cabbage worms, perhaps. I, I sacrificed some kale to a few of them before. I went to work and they were fine and I came back and my kale was down to the ribs. So I, I feel your pain um, that those little green worms got your, got your kale. But um, probably the cabbage worm, cabbage looper. Uh, you can use a carbaryl product. You can pick them off. Um, you could use one of the organic options if you choose, if you're able to find them. That's going to be the kicker is you got to find those little buddies. Yeah, I just treated my kale with some BT. So it was uh, thuricide, so BT is a bacteria, and it's in the environment everywhere. We encounter it every day in our lives, uh, but you put this powder or you can spray it on the plant, and it basically gives the worms a tummy ache, and they can't eat anymore, and they die. So anything else to add, insect people? You know, another strategy would be to use row covers. So if you, when you first get your kale in the ground, uh, if you were to put row covers over the row, that's a physical protection. It prevents the moths from coming in and laying eggs on the leaves. And since kale doesn't require pollination, you know, for the leaves to grow, you can just let the plants grow until you're ready to harvest, you know, take the row cover off long enough to harvest and then put it back on. And um, so that's just another strategy that you could use. Um, I can tell you the strategy. Um, we have a lot of people that ask us how we don't ever have um, much problem with our kales in the backyard farmer garden. Uh, we just plant extra. So fully knowing that they'll probably go after one or two um, or a little bit of a handful, but fully knowing that we'll have other ones someplace else to harvest. So that's another option for you is just plant for the insects. When you do that for zucchini, all of them produce, and then you have zucchini coming out your ears. And then you donate them. <laughs> uh, so you're going to have little green worms soon in the backyard farmer garden because I featured a cabbage leaf on air on Thursday and it had uh, cabbage worm eggs all over it. So they're coming for your cabbage. Uh, dry tips on the kale leaves, I think probably is just uh, heat and dry weather. I think it probably needs watered. So then we have, so John Fesh was talking about bay plants. So people didn't know they, or never tried to grow bay here because they weren't sure it was hardy. It's not. We just talked about taking it inside with rosemary. Uh, but then I got a private message from Georgia asking about her bay plants always dying. Any suggestions? Any expert uh, bay experts there? Well, I, I will consider myself an expert because I've only been growing it for a year. So um, I think in order to be an expert on a plant, you have to have tried it, failed, and figured out why you failed, and then try it again. So um, that hasn't happened to me yet, so I don't know. You know, it's probably like what John was talking about. When you have it outside for the summer and it loves the outdoors, um, you have to think of it, it is, you think about its native environment. And like poinsettias, you know, they're native to Mexico and they grow in Israel and places like that very well. And then you bring them here and they become very difficult to grow after Christmas. So um, I think 
digging in a little deeper to its native origin would be helpful. And thinking about our homes in mid-January is not a very hospitable place to grow many plants. And so as, as gardeners, as tender, lover, tender loving caregivers, we try to do something to help it out. And that means you could fertilize or water and usually both of those are added in too much quantity. So I think a little more investigation and well-drained soil is good. Yeah. If I can um, share, one of the issues that we often see with the bay plant is the insect called the scale. Um, okay. The scale is a snap-sucking insect and they blend in so wonderfully on the plant that they can get out of control before you actually notice a large population. So uh, check for scale insects. And then um, another thing is if you transplant uh, the bay into a larger container, we often transplant into too, too large of a container. We want to move from like a four inch pot to a six, a six inch pot. So don't be over excited uh, to move it from a four inch to like an eight or a 12 inch because all that extra potting mix will act as a wet sock or a wet shoe and can cause some issues down the road, so. So I think some good information there. So I'm going to actually launch a poll question that should pop up on your screen. And while we're doing that, uh, we had a question about moving strawberries this fall. Uh, when when should we move strawberries? Uh, and I'll launch the poll here. And just answer the first one. I don't know why it did all of them at once. So now you can see the preview. So the first question is, uh, did you start a vegetable garden or increase your gardening this year as a result of the pandemic and or food issues? Um, well, while people are answering the poll question, um, related to your question about the strawberries, I would say the ideal time to move strawberries would be in the spring. Um, I think that they would have a much longer period of time for them to grow and have good root development and really become established. I think it would be iffy in the fall. If you want to try it, you can, but there is certainly the potential that the plants don't root in well enough before winter. You could have some uh, plant death. So just keep that in mind. Spring would really be a better time, I believe. I think spring would be the best, give you the longest time to recover, but also right after harvest, uh, when you're going through renovation, might be also acceptable. I remember, if, those of you who are longtime backyard farmer viewers, of course, will remember Don Steiniger, and his favorite, favorite chagrin was uh, someone asking about a strawberry patch instead of strawberry rose. And I think it was his goal to try to get strawberry growers to actually grow plants in rows and actually renovate each year, take on out the oldest plants, and then kind of like Sarah's encouraging people to do is grow new ones. Um, and, you know, early summer is still enough time to get that going. So either, you know, uh, early spring or early summer after renovation, I think is the key. Mm -hmm. And so, John, the whole reason to go from a strawberry patch to a rose is because it's more productive. The more edges you have, the more space the plants have, the better they're going to produce. But too often, um, and this is what Don was getting at, people just let their strawberries grow into a really thick, dense mat of plants. Yeah. And those plants don't produce nearly as well as plants in rose will or a, or a planting that is renovated and thinned every year the way that it should be. Yeah, it's sort of like a convenience, like you put it in a bed and you just let it go and you don't have right. to manage it as much, but you <laughs> trade off on production. So you have to figure out which is more important for you. So we have folks answering the questions and I guess you have to answer all of them. So you can go ahead and answer those and uh, we will continue. I'll just leave that up. We have about 20 people answered so far. Uh, and we'll move on uh, to... Uh, 
anxious to hear what might tolerate the hot soil temperatures for reasonable German germination rates in our veggie gardens. So I'm guessing that question that's from Craig. I don't know um, exactly like you're looking to, to like sow some seeds right now this time of year. Um, I don't know, some of the cold, so right now would not be the time to plant the cool season crops, uh, except for like starting seeds of broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage, they can take heat when you start them, but they have to get cooler uh, in the fall, but like lettuce, radishes, stuff like that, not a time to do that. Spinach has to have cold weather to germinate, so it would not come up even if, it, if you did plant it. Um, what are some other thoughts? So Craig, if you wanna to be more specific, I see you're on video, you can unmute yourself and, and ask if you want. Any other thoughts from the, the panel of experts about mm -hmm. cool season crops and, or what, can, what we can tolerate heat right now? I've had some luck where I've interplanted some lettuces and stuff like underneath my tomatoes where they're shaded and cooler. Um, so I've had some luck if you are interested in doing something like that. Yeah, providing shade can help cool out the soil temperatures a little bit and have those that stuff that doesn't like heat. And we'll talk about fall gardening next week. That'll be a little preview. And so we'll talk about stuff that you can plant right now for the fall. It'll be coming next week. Any other uh, items from our assembled experts. One thing that I've had good luck with when planting a fall garden is using a uh, board to keep the soil moist. If it's windy and hot, that seed can dry out pretty quickly. So just a piece of one by six that you plop down on top of the newly planted uh, seed will give you a little bit of an edge. And then you check it every other day um, or so and like uh, Terry was saying, just to see what the development is and when it does start to sprout, then you need to get rid of the board. But in the meantime, it does help. Um, so it's just a little, a little trick. Yeah. Okay, so we, we were talking about uh, heat. And so we got some questions related to heat. And so we answered some of them in the chat, just, but just so everyone can see what's going on. And, hear what's going on. What are, what, why does heat make our tomatoes not produce or things not do well in the garden? Anyone want to share? John, heat is a big uh, influence on flower pollination. And if the pollen, the male pollen in the flowers gets too dry due to heat, um, it, it may not transfer or stick to the female part of the flower, the stigma very well, which, which could result in a lack of pollination. So Pollination problems are a big um, issue that you run into during hot weather. And unfortunately, there's not a whole lot that you can do about it. There are some cultivars, um, specifically of tomatoes, I'm thinking, which um, do pollinate better under hot conditions. Um, oftentimes, these, these cultivars are called, or they have a heat set gene, which allows them to still pollinate under hot conditions. Um, so that can definitely be a big issue when, when we have high temperatures. Uh, the University of Louisiana has a nice list of tomatoes that do well for Louisiana. Now, I don't know if they would be good cultivars for Nebraska because our climate is very different, but um, they were rated on their ability for heat tolerance. So uh, that's something that you could look for is uh, online um, University of Louisiana tomatoes and it should pull up that document so that might be a good resource. So thanks for answering that. So yes, heat, you know, disables the pollen, lots of things going on with the heat. Aside from just making the plants wilty and, and not grow well, so there, you know, heat, you know, so watering in that condition can help with the plant health. It will not help with the pollination. Uh, I'm scrolling through because we haven't heard a lot about bugs and diseases yet. So I wanna see what's going on. And we have a question down in the chat about cicada killer wasps. 
And does their activity disturb plants? There's a bunch around this person's hosta. I'm going to toss it over to Jody Green, who is the cicada killer expert. I haven't seen any like hosta death due to cicadas. I mean, they're not chewing on anything. They just kind of disrupt the soil, but that soil is usually pretty dry and sandy. And so, I mean, it might deter them if you can keep that soil wet, which will also be kind of good for your plant as well. But yeah, all I know is that they're out and about and they like the soil and the full sun. So that's why I haven't seen them a lot near Hosta because of the full sun issue, but they, I have seen them around a lot of plants and they seem to do just fine, both the bug and the plant. Well, thanks for that, Jody. Yeah, we've, you know, we're seeing a lot. I know you've been seeing a lot of questions about cicada killers uh, and the people are confusing them with something else. Do you want to tell people like what we don't have in Nebraska that everyone's freaking out about. These are not murder hornets. They are not going to hurt you. They're they are not gonna hurt anybody really. The female is very busy uh, catching cicadas and digging those burrows and the males, they just fly around. Uh, my daughter caught 134 cicada killer wasps in three days in our neighborhood. Um, so if someone deserves to be stung, it's probably her, um, but she did not get stung at all. Like it, they're not aggressive. And uh, we're actually gonna donate all those insects to Morel Hall and the entomology collection. So she's pretty excited about that. She's 10 and that's her sport. <laughs> so maybe we can make it a competitive sport like cicada killer capture. Yeah, I mean, if you don't have to kill them, I, w I wouldn't. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a school and when they go back, I know the school board will want to use pesticide and if, if there's minimal because she caught them or, you know, whatever, she'll feel proud and we won't have pesticide in the school ground. So it's kind of a win-win. There's not a shortage, but I do believe that they saw their first one in Lincoln and so, you know, how it goes, it kind of goes um, west, so you may be seeing them. They're really big wasps and they seem very aggressive, but they really aren't. Um, they can disturb some parts of your landscape, especially uh, retaining walls, but it really has to do with the full sun and the type of soil, so. Yeah, and I think what freaks a lot of people out is you see usually see so many of them at once, that you can have hundreds just hovering in the same spot. Right. Yeah, so I mean, one female, so I looked this up today, one female can have like 15 different offspring. And so if you think of, you know, they put 15 eggs in the ground, the next year there's 15 for every female. So if it's really not something you want, you will have to treat every individual whole. And I know that some experts are seeing like seven, seven dust, so a carbaryl dust or insecticidal dust. But that female, she also uses her legs and digs out that soil. So she moves that around too. So it's something that is very tedious and time consuming. So I would, I would pick the ones that are most annoying and try to get those. Okay, well, thank you for that. So on to diseases, black spots on tomato leaves. So they're using the term spots, maybe like a leaf spot. Uh, our disease people, Kyle. What could we what, what could we have on our tomato leaves? Yeah, it really could be could be a few things. You could be dealing with um, with early blight. You know, definitely have been have been seeing early blight show up. Um, another one that you might be seeing with some that are kind of black spots would be septoria leaf spot as well. Um, that can have some some kind of black spots. As far as as far as control for both of those, really they're um, one thing you'll really want to be doing is making sure that you are removing heavily infected leaves and making sure that you have that you are watering from the base of the plant. Both of these are path or both of the fungi that cause these diseases splash up from the soil. Um, so with that really avoid that overhead watering as, as much as possible. And hopefully that will that will help de um, help decrease it. Otherwise, there are some uh, there are some uh, fungicides. Um, just a, a common garden fun, uh, fungicide typically will work fairly well for um, for both of those diseases. But big thing is going to be air um, airflow through the canopy there. 
So I will stay in the Zoom. Uh, Scott and myself put a link to the PDF on tomato leaf spots. Uh, since there's so many, looking at those pictures and comparing are really helpful. And I already stated in my garden, I got early blight like crazy. Well, one of the reasons why I have early blight is I like it, because um, I'm a weird disease nerd. But the other big thing is usually what I try to do early in the season is I prune my leaves up really, really severe, usually about eight to nine inches from the ground once my plant is getting established because I don't need those bottom leaves. And especially with um, early blight, that disease always comes from the soil and works its way up. So um, pruning up your leaves early in the season really slows down your early blight. And if you like heirlooms, just like the kale, you throw in a few extra plants. It never hurts. So if one dies to early blight, you still have another plant. That's a good plan. So yeah, we have all those different spots and things going on with tomatoes. And so really it's just watching out and, and uh, you know, taking off the leaves that you can and, and using a, a fungicide if necessary. Uh, so keep a watch on that. So we have several questions about coal crops, like cabbage that's turning yellow and eventually dies. We have some broccoli that the heads are very small. Uh, and I think that's uh, a good, you know, I think we can lump those together um, because they don't do that well when it gets really hot. Uh, the cabbage, I think, is probably a heat issue. And maybe uh, if the bottom leaves are just turning yellow, could be fertility, might need to fertilize. Uh, but a lot of those things, once the weather gets this hot, they don't do well. And so some people will plant them in spring and the earlier, the better you can get, but they're done by this time of the year. But really we find that the best time of year to grow a lot of those things is the fall. Uh, because if you think about it, it's hot in the beginning of fall, but it keeps getting uh, cooler. Uh, and so actually this time, and this is why next week we're talking about fall gardening, like right now is the time if you wanted to grow broccoli or cabbage or cauliflower or kale or Brussels sprouts or any one of their relatives in the garden, uh, you would start the seeds now. Uh, you would, um, you know, you can put them in, in pots and containers and you don't have to put them inside, you can keep them outside if you can keep them watered enough when it's hot. Uh, any other folks want to share about those cool season crops, uh, the cold crops and when to plant them or, you know, we'll get into it more next week if you join us, but Anything else that we should share with folks about those? I'll just agree with what you said, John. Some of the cold crops like cauliflower and broccoli and such actually have, can have a little bit of a hard time in the spring because um, uh, freezing temperatures or, or getting suddenly hot can affect um, the head size. And so you can have trouble with, you know, the heads just not developing properly um, or the plants going to seed too fast. So, you know, fall gardening really can be a, a better time of year to grow these plants because you have the heat that you need for seed germination, but then you have the cool temperatures you need for good head development and good flavor when you harvest. Mm -hmm. Scrolling down, I see a question about cilantro and cilantro is not a cold crop, but it's another one that doesn't like heat. So planting an, a really early crop for spring would be good. This time of year, you, like it will flower um, if you want more, you can plant again, uh, sow it again in the fall when the temperatures start to cool down um, because it doesn't do well in the heat. However, it will flower and it will produce seeds and those seeds are actually coriander. So it's a, a spice all in its own uh, if you want some coriander. Um, I'm just going through and uh, colleagues, if I miss anything that you think we need to, if we haven't answered it in the chat, um, and we think we should talk about it. Let's talk about um, rotating crops, specifically tomatoes. Uh, how do we rotate crops? Do we have any uh, basic guidance for that? One of the things um, that people sometimes forget is that uh, tomatoes are in the nightshade family, which also includes peppers, eggplants, and potatoes. And so sometimes we get clients that forget that tomatoes and peppers are in the same family. So they put one, they 
they consider that rotation and we want to make sure that we're rotating families that um, if we're moving um, if you're having a tomato issue that we move all of our nightshade family plants out of a spot and then put on leafy greens or um, an unrelated. Um, Sarah, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Um, just that, you know, if you have one garden plot that you're using to grow your vegetables and you till up that garden plot in the spring or in the fall, just remember that you're mixing all of those pathogens throughout that whole planting bed. So rotating your tomatoes, for example, from one corner of the planting bed to another corner of the planting bed really isn't effective because you've got your pathogens spread throughout the whole, the whole bed. So, you know, you could rotate um, into containers and typically we're gonna recommend about a three to four year rotation cycle. Um, so as Scott said, you could rotate um, over time. So maybe one year you plant a big crop of um, things in the nightshade family, tomatoes and peppers, do a bunch of canning. And then the next year you grow um, a big, grow, a big uh, planting of corn, or you do a lot of squash and melons, or you do, um, you know, onions and leafy greens or whatever. So you're planting with different crops over the course of three or four years and not coming back with plants in a, in a specific family um, until you get to that three to four year time frame. Um, so home gardeners with, this, with, a, with one small plot to work with, rotation can be a real, a real challenge. You know, John, you just asked about other questions. And I think this question that Nancy asks here in the chat follows up with that about um, what should you look for in a location? And that is something that I think is really good, especially if we're gonna focus next week on fall gardening. What, what's a good location? Yeah, so um, for things like tomatoes, you definitely want full sun, which means at least six hours of full sun. Uh, and then, you know, the space that works for you, like size-wise, how much you want to produce. Um, we actually have some new resources that can help you uh, sort of answer some of those questions, and I'll share them in a minute, our um, gardening, Vegetable Gardening 101 website. Uh, I know we've gotten a lot of questions in the chat, trying to get through them. So many good questions. We have about 15 minutes left. Uh, so I want to make sure we get, you know, we've, we've answered several of them. Um, I actually got a, an email uh, submission uh, with a picture. Uh, and so I will share that picture. Uh, so the person wants to know if this is something that she planted, they think it might be a bitter melon. So they think it might be uh, like a, a melon plant, or is it a weed that came up? So let's see. Um, does, do we have any thought, are there any weeds that look like this? Uh, or do we think it's an actual melon? Or have we stumped people? Well, the leaf shape, John, looks a little bit like burr cucumber. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if, uh, if that could be what it is. I need to see the flowers and the fruits to be able to know for sure. I would uh, concur with Sarah. That's what I first thought of when I first saw it. I was going to ask you if she sent you a flower, a picture of the flower. Uh, no pictures of flowers. So I do have, I mean, I have one more picture, but it doesn't show anything really different than that. I can share it as well. So we had that. Yeah. So I'm t I was leaning toward burr cucumber as well. Uh, so you want to take a look uh, if you, you know, when it flowers or starts to set fruit, if you want to send me another picture, we'll take a look. But there is a weed called burr cucumber um, that looks exactly like that. So it could be that. Um, but a lot of the cucumbery squash things look very similar. So it could be something that was planted. Uh, as well. No flowers yet, she's saying in the chat. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Any other questions? So one question that I saw um, somebody asked about starting asparagus and when was the best time? 
Um, I think that especially if you have room, it's always fun to add some of those perennials um, to your garden, uh, like rhubarb or um, some small fruits um, or asparagus. Asparagus is best planted in the spring. Um, we actually have a couple of videos online that you would be able to get through Backyard Farmer that uh, really walk you through how to do that. Um, I know some people start it by seed, but I am an impatient gardener, so I would never start mine by seed. I would buy crowns um, online. So. <laughs> yeah. so there was another question about, um, I think the question was about when to start an asparagus bed. Uh, usually that spring, um, that's usually when you can buy them. Uh, in the garden center. Uh, you could, I guess, if you really wanted to, like transplant it in the fall, like we tell you other stuff. So any other thoughts from our esteemed colleagues? I would agree, John. I think spring would be ideal, the ideal time to, to plant. Um, I don't know, if you were getting divisions or something from a friend and you wanted to plant them in the fall, you could. Um, but typically crowns are available in spring. So, but you could start pre-planning um, now and start getting your soil prep done and doing all that now um, in time for spring. So actually kind of pre-planning now is, is actually a really good time to figure out where it could live and, and all that, because it, it, it will be something that will be there for quite some time. Right. So I have a follow-up question for you guys, asparagus. In my neck of the woods up here in northern or northeast or north central Nebraska, sorry, there's lots of wild asparagus. And a question I get a lot is, can I dig it up and move it? I mean, yeah, technically you can. Um, you know, it's asparagus. Usually those older varieties, the wild varieties, aren't as productive as some of the newer cultivars that you would buy. Um, specifically the female plants because they put a lot of energy into producing flowers and berries um, versus the male. So all the new ones you buy will be male plants. Uh, a lot of the older varieties will be mixed and the wild ones will usually be mixed as well. Um, so you can definitely dig those up and move them. Uh, and even horticulturalists kill their asparagus. Scott says he killed his. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Beth is asking when to plant garlic in the fall sometime, but when I usually say um, uh, between around October, uh, you could do it like into September, into October. I tell people the way to remember when to plant garlic is that you need garlic in order to keep the vampires away at Halloween. And that's when you uh, plant your garlic and then it will uh, be ready to harvest usually May, June, or July next year, depending on what variety. I just harvested mine about two weeks ago. Uh, and so it is uh, drying out in the storage building. Uh, and then one last question that I saw uh, was about raspberries that are breaking off about two inches above the ground. Do we think it's an insect, like a boring insect of some sort, or do we think it's a, a disease? Um, Anyone have any thoughts on that one? So raspberries are prone to cane bores. And um, what I would look for in those stems would be tunneling. You know, where hollowing out of the stems would be an indication of bores attacking the stems. So that certainly is a possibility. Um, just, just as a reminder, you know, most raspberries um, are they're on a two-year cycle, you know, so um, all of the fruiting canes this year, all the canes you harvest fruit from should be cut down this year because they won't fruit again next year. And you want the new young canes, those are your, the prima canes from this year that do not fruit, you'll, you'll hold those over and you'll harvest from those next year. So if you're on a regular pruning cycle, um, cane borers shouldn't be a huge issue uh, because you'll be taking out the older canes every year. Um, but even so, you could still get a few in there and cause some uh, uh, stems or canes to break. 
so Sarah, I actually have um, one of the newer raspberries and it produces um, the fruiting canes every year. So I can cu actually cut it back. It's called raspberry shortcake. Mm -hmm. um, and the, it doesn't get a lot, but enough to have, you know, a couple of things on some homemade ice cream in the summertime. So nice, but it does run quite a bit. I would. <laughs> so heritage is another raspberry cultivar um, that can be managed in that same way. So you cut all the canes down every year, you get new growth, all new, all new shoots in the spring. They all fruit in that year and you cut them all down again uh, at the end of the year. So there are cultivars out there. It makes management a little bit easier because you don't have to try to figure out, okay, what's a primocane? What's a, what's a fruiting cane? You just cut them all down. Yeah, definitely, um, you know, different management. So thank you for that. So uh, we're wrapping up with a few more questions and I just had some information to share with people uh, as we're doing that. So uh, questions I saw were when to harvest horseradish. That's typically uh, I think the fall before it uh, goes dormant is when you harvest that. Um, so late summer, early fall is when you want to do that. Any um, month, any month that has an R in it. Any month that has an R in it. That's a good way to remember. Uh, and um, someone planted 35 elderberry plants, which are taking quite well. Do you need to wait a few years to harvest? Typically, yes. Um, taking off the berries and flowers for a few, a few years will let the roots form on fruiting plants. So as we finish up, um, we just have a few minutes left. I wanted to just share some resources. Uh, so this is the first in a series of these uh, Grow Big Red virtual learning series. So this one's a little bit different um, that we just took questions tonight. We didn't have any presentation prepared. Uh, the following ones will have about a 15 to 20 minute presentation each night and then time for questions, just like we did tonight. Um, and here is the schedule. Uh, next week is fall gardening and then tomatoes and then um, preserving the harvest. And then we're going to switch over and talk about trees for a few weeks. Uh, tree problems, tree selection, tree planting and tree care. And then we're going to jump back and talk about some, some late fall stuff for the vegetable garden, cover crops composting and putting your garden to bed for the winter. Um, and uh, Jody Green is actually going to be a part of that to talk about what insects might overwinter in our garden and what debris you might want to leave uh, for those. So I'm excited about that. So uh, you, it's the same registration link. If you didn't, you should have been able to register for all of these at once. If you need to go back, you can go through the registration process again. You might be able to create um, correct your registration and add more if you want to, to add those on. But uh, by registering, you have the connection information for all the rest of them uh, for the rest of the, the season. We do have a uh, brand new for uh, people starting vegetable gardening or people experienced with vegetable gardening and just needing some help. This is our Vegetable Garden 101 uh, website for steps to vegetable gardening. Uh, you can go to go.unl.edu slash veggies101 to get that uh, information. Uh, and you can um, find all kinds of stuff in there. And we're always adding stuff, tweaking stuff. So there will all be all kinds of new stuff added to there uh, throughout. Of course, Backyard Farmer, uh, our TV show, lots of us, you might have seen on the, on the screen tonight, you see on there as well. Um, you can watch us Thursday nights through the growing season uh, at 7 p.m. Or you can find all the information, including the YouTube channel, where you can go watch episodes anytime at byf.unl.edu. Uh, and next week, you can join us uh, at 7 p.m., same day, Tuesday, for fall gardening. And we'll talk about uh, starting those fall vegetables and when you should plant what and do what. So that's all I had this evening. We've had a lot of questions and I see everyone saying thank you. So thank you for joining. Uh, the last question I saw there is, is there a recording of this episode we can watch again? Uh, so we intend to record the presentations uh, that we have and share those online. Uh, but what we can do is we did record this, they all automatically record, is we can share the recording with everyone registered, uh, the, whole, the whole episode if you wanna watch again. And then we'll be posting public for a short period uh, the actual recorded presentations. 
Uh, and then uh, I guess as we're signing off, we have one last question. Um, I'm plant, I plant in pots and was wondering if I need to water those pots that don't have plants in them if I'm waiting, rotating those three to four years. Uh, so if you're rotating and you already have soil in there, you can plant other stuff in the pots uh, or wait and get those pots when you're ready for them. You don't have to hold on to them for the four years. You'd also want to um, help because uh, that soil would have some microbes in it too. So keeping it moist would help keep those microbes alive, which are good in your mm -hmm. soil. So if you're not planting anything in them. Yeah, if you, uh, I actually let, letting it dry out would probably be a lot better scenario in order to kill any of the soil microbes. Yeah, the bad microbes. Yep. Okay, well, thank you all for joining us. So we will wrap up here. And for those of you joining us next week, we will see you next week. Uh, and until then, happy gardening.